Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin. Rolex fails us. What's the fail? The new Submariner book. Who's us? Hardcore Rolex enthusiasts. Now, this fail is a two-tiered fail, and we're going to talk about both of them. We'll talk about the less egregious of the two first. It's more trifling than anything else, but it's the lack of detail and nuance in the figures. Take, for example, the 5517 mil sub. They list the production numbers between 500 and 600 pieces, but we know that they made 1,200 mil subs. The thing is, they just don't even talk about the first two iterations of that watch. The first being the 5513. It was made from the 5513 sub, and it's uh, got that reference number on the case. They don't even tell us the amount of 5513 mil subs out there. And then the second iteration, what's called the double stamped mill subs, that has the 5513 forward slash 5517 stamp on the case. Those double stamped mill subs, we don't know how many are out there. So that's really uh, unfortunate because that's the kind of detail that us wash enthusiasts were after. Another failing in this regard would be the triple zero, the date sub, right? The one, six, eight, zero, zero, zero. That's a true transition sub. It's when they first started using 904L steel on the sub. And the difference between that model and its predecessor, the one, six, eight, double zero, was only that one zero. You couldn't distinguish it otherwise. And even the papers of the triple zeros actually had the older reference number, the 16800 on the papers. So that's a, a really interesting model and very historic. And they don't give us the production numbers there. It seems to be conflated with the 16800, its predecessor. Those are the details that we wanted that's what we were hoping for as watch enthusiasts. That's the first fail. The second fail, much more egregious, and it's the fact that they got things wrong. There are inaccuracies throughout the book. An example, well, take a look at this mill sub. Have you noticed anything wrong with it? Well, look at the bezel insert. It should have ticks all the way around it. And there are other mistakes throughout the book if you're curious about them. Link in the description to an article by Jose Perestroika, and he lists some of them from just the few pages that he was sent. So why the fail? Well, a big part is the author, Nick Folks. Now, he is a historian, he's written 40 books, and I can see why Rolex chose him. Here's the problem, he's not a watch guy, he's not an enthusiast, and he was in too deep. He doesn't have the watch knowledge to write this book, and so, you get these inaccuracies. What Rolex should have done is they should have hired a team of people and he could have been the head writer, but of those team of people, half of them should have been watch experts. Now, maybe they were thinking, you know, we're giving Nick all of the access to these files and, you know, if we let more than one person in there, things are gonna leak. And yeah, information is gonna leak and that could be embarrassing, but much more embarrassing is what has happened. And that is from God itself comes the word. And in our new Rolex approved Bible, there are mistakes throughout it. That's awkward. They should have also had watch experts check the book. Again, they were probably thinking, you know, if we send this book out to be checked, it's gonna leak, information is gonna leak. But again, I think it's worse what's happening now. Rolex is also to blame. You might not know this, but until relatively recently, they really haven't been that interested in their own history. And I'm talking about the people that work there. They're thinking about the modern iterations of their watches and to the future. They don't really think about the past a lot. And I'll give you an illustration of this. About a decade ago, they invited four watch journalists to tour their facilities. And when asked about some of the older watches, the response that came from Rolex is, and this is a quote, why would we show you inferior models? That's how they regarded the older watches in the past. Now they've started to come around relatively recently in the last decade and a big reason is probably enthusiasts like us. We are their base and I think they know that. And they know that there's a market for this information and for their history. 
but most of the people at Rolex, they really don't know anything about those past watches. And yes, all the information is there. And that's what Nick folks used to write it, but they don't really visit the vaults, put it that way. And I've got to lay some blame also at the foot of the Rolex historian. Yes, that's a job there. And wow, they must be having a bad week, put it that way. I mean, they have one job and it's become very clear that uh, they failed in it. And I hate that for them. It must be a very difficult position to be in. In the future, they're gonna come out with a GMT book and a Daytona book, and we just want them to get it right, and they can. And let's look at this as a learning opportunity and hope they get it right in the future. What do you think about this fail? Now, I love Rolex, you know that, but they are, to say the least, a proud company, a little too proud at times. Conceited, you might say. So there was a bit of schadenfreude when I realized what was going on. But look, I'm rooting for the company and I want them to get it right. And I want a great GMT book whenever that comes. And I want details and I want accuracies and I want the word of God to be as good as we should expect it. So I'm rooting for him. But what, again, do you think? Let me know. Take care. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.